today I'll be talking about um, an interesting subsurface, subsurface oxygen feature that we've identified in Rivers Inlet. And I'd like to thank my co-authors from Fisheries and Oceans Canada and from the University of British Columbia. This work was just published last month in Estuaries and Coasts. Uh, and if you'd like a copy of the paper, you can email me. I've just put my email on the slide here. So just a brief outline. Uh, first, I'll introduce Rivers Inlet. Then I'll give an overview of the data that have been collected. I'll give a definition of this oxygen minimum layer or OML. I'll show some results and then uh, I'll show the processes that form the OML. So it's an upwelling, or sorry, a downwelling remineralization and upwelling process. And then I'll talk a bit about um, possible ecological implications. So Rivers Inlet is an inlet that's on the mainland coast of British Columbia. Uh, you can see it pictured here. It's located between the northern tip of Vancouver Island and Haida Gwaii. Uh, it's uh, about 45 kilometers long in total and about three kilometers wide at its widest. The maximum depth is in this basin here. It's about 340 meters deep. And the sill is, is at the mouth of the inlet and it's about 140 meters deep. Um, what's interesting about Rivers Inlet is that the mouth is exposed to Queen Charlotte Sound and Queen Charlotte Sound is a very dynamic area that has a lot of influences from the open ocean. But Rivers Inlet isn't unique and in fact it's one of about 53 inlets on the British Columbia coast that's based on uh, estimates by Picard and he's defined them as inlets that are at least 18.5 kilometers long. So things that we learn about Rivers Inlet can be applied to other inlets in British Columbia, I believe. Oh, sorry, go back here. What's also interesting about Rivers Inlet and actually a lot of the inlets along the coast is that there's really long time series. So um, Picard was a professor at UBC and he started collecting temperature, salinity and oxygen data in most of the inlets in British Columbia in 1951. Uh, and so there's these really beautiful, really long time series and Rivers in, in, is one example of that. There isn't a lot of data in, in the um, early years, but we still have some data points. So what I'm showing here is the time series. Uh, the top is the number of CTD profiles or temperature profiles and the bottom is a number of oxygen profiles. And so you can see that there were a few data points before about 1998, um, but then starting in 1998, there's been a very long uh, time series with multiple observations per year. And what's significant about 1998, well, in the 1990s, Rivers Inlet had one of the biggest sockeye salmon runs in Canada, the second biggest one, and it crashed in around 1993 or 1994, and it hasn't really recovered, and that's been one of the main reasons that people have been studying Rivers Inlet. Uh, there's three different institutes or main groups who have collected data from Rivers Inlet, um, the University of British Columbia starting in 1951, Fisheries and Oceans Canada started sampling rivers inlets um, in about 1990. And then the Hakai Institute, we've been collecting monthly samples there since 2013, and that's still ongoing. And these data were brought together for this analysis. So when we started looking at the data, we enter, uh, identified this really interesting feature in oxygen. So what I'm showing here is an example. On the left is a temperature profile. In the middle is a salinity profile and on the right is an oxygen profile. Uh, and, uh, and generally there's three different layers within Rivers Inlet. The surface layer in this case is everything that's, I've, I've defined as everything lighter than 1022.5 uh, kilograms per meter square or cubic meter. And in this case, it's only the upper four meters. Intermediate water is everything that's between that surface layer and the sill depth. So in this case, it's about five to 139 meters. And deep water is everything between the sill depth and the bottom. And uh, what jumps out here is this oxygen minimum that's within the intermediate layer. And you can see it here highlighted in blue. And uh, it was consistent in many of the profiles, especially in the summer season. So we decided to define it. And this is how we defined it. Um, we considered an oxygen minimum for one when the minimum value was less than three milliliters per liter. And we also said that the minimum value, because 
Um, especially at the Hakai Institute, we actually don't collect bottle oxygen. So we're relying on sensors only. And we understand that sensors have a lot of uncertainty. So we said it's present if the minimum value is at least 0.3 milliliters per liter, less than the maximum value below. And that just accounts for the plus or minus 10% of oxygen error associated with these sensors. So, so if in this case, um, the oxygen minimum is this point right here, that's the lowest oxygen, and the oxygen in the water below is at least 0.3 milliliters per liter higher than that. And so in this case, there definitely is an oxygen minimum here. And then we went on to define what the layer is that's surrounding this oxygen minimum. And so we said the base of this layer is the maximum oxygen con concentration below. And then the top of this layer is the same concentration as what the base is. So in this case, again, the blue line shows the, the extent of this layer. And then we applied that definition to all of the profiles in Rivers Inland. And this is the kind of picture that emerged. So, so I'll, I'll walk you through this. So there were eight years in particular that we had really good seasonal coverage of data collection in Rivers Inlet. And so I've shown these eight years here. And I'm showing only the summer seasons because it started um, after looking at the data, we realized that uh, this oxygen minimum layer was present in summer months. So here I'm just showing May through September. Uh, and uh, so this example in 2008, so um, you can see this, this feature here right in the center. This is this oxygen minimum here. What I'm showing in this black bounding um, is the, the definition of the oxygen minimum layer. And then the isopycnals are shown here as well. And so you see lots of different cases, like in any year, every year there's something that looks quite different. Um, in some cases, it's, it's quite high oxygen. In other cases, it's lower oxygen. But in general, it's present every year that we examined. Um, and it was intensified at the head of the inlet, and it was not always present at the mouth of the inlet. We compared concentrations of oxygen along isopycnals offshore, and um, that feature wasn't there. So that led us to believe that it's something that's formed within the inlet. The other thing that we noticed is uh, looking at the isopycnals, um, and there's a really 2008, again, is quite a good example, but when the 1025.75 isopycnal shoals, that normally indicates upwelling within the inlet, and that's around the same timing as when we see this oxygen minimum layer start to form. And then when the 1026 isopycnal starts to shoal, it shoals about a month or two later, you see sort of an increase in oxygen at that time. And so that's sort of when the base of the oxygen minimum layer forms is when that higher oxygen water upwells. Um, another thing you can see here is that before the oxygen minimum layer forms, there often is very low oxygen in the, in the deep water of the inlet. And this is different than what we're talking about here. It's really low oxygen. It's, um, we believe through remineralization through the winter months. Um, but it's not the seasonal formed oxygen minimum layer that we see forming in the summer months. Uh, there's, you know, there's lots of interannual variabilities. So we, we looked into what could be causing that interannual variability. And, uh, you know, we landed on the wind. So what I'm showing here is a cumulative upwelling index from 1967 through 19, or through 2018. Um, the colored lines are the ones, the same years that I showed in the past slide. And this is based on the back and upwelling index from 51 degrees north, 131 degrees west. Uh, negative slope here, so in this case, for example, the strong negative slope that we see in 2010, that indicates really strong downwelling. And then a positive slope indicates an upwelling period, again, as we see in 2010. This location is generally downwelling favorable, but there are times in the summer when upwelling winds dominate. And so again, you can see here, like in 2010 and in 2016, were two of the strongest downwelling years on record. And in 2010 um, and 2016 as well, we saw quite strong upwelling. So again, there's lots of interannual variability. We then took those cumulative upwelling index data and we applied it to the properties that are within Rivers Inlet. 
So what I'm showing here uh, on the bottom is a cumulative upwelling index for six weeks before the observations at Rivers Inlet. And we tried a bunch of different time periods. We tried one week, two week, four, six, eight, 10, and 14 weeks before the period um, of the observation. And we found that six weeks is the most correlated. And so on the left, again, we have temperature. On the middle, we have salinity. And then on the right, we have dissolved oxygen. So this is for all of the observations within rivers inlets um, at 100 meters, which is sort of the depth that we tend to see this oxygen minimum layer. And you can see, I'll, I'll stick with salinity here. It's really well correlated, like uh, our square value of 0.78. And so we have uh, fresher water when the CUI is really negative, which indicates really strong downwelling. And we have saltier water when the CUI is positive, which indicates upwelling. Um, and, and so that's a really strong relationship. And that indicates that the waters that are at 100 meters in Rivers Inlet are largely controlled by the upwelling and downwelling winds. Uh, oxygen as well is really well correlated, uh, not quite as well correlated as salinity, um, but that's largely because of temperature. Temperature is not well correlated. And during this time, we saw uh, a strong trend of warming, um, which is why we you know temperature probably isn't correlated. And of course, the warming trend also impacts the oxygen concentrations as well. And so actually, I'm just going to step back here to this slide and just try and explain what we think is happening. So what we think is happening is in the, the winter months, um, we have really strong downwelling and that essentially sets up uh, a coastal current to south, um, from the southeast uh, current that um, advects water into rivers inlet. And this water is really well oxygenated. So the upper, you know, 150 meters or so during the winter months is really well oxygenated. As soon as those downwelling winds stop, there's no more mechanism to introduce walk oxygen into the intermediate layer. And so at that time, um, oxygen, utilize it, oxygen starts to be utilized by remineralization. Um, and then at the end of, um, at the same time, upwelling starts, and then you get this reoxygenated water entering rivers inlet by the deep water, and that essentially forms the base of this oxygen minimum layer. So I'm going to just jump ahead here again to the a piece about remineralization. This is why we think that uh, that this is an important process here. So what I'm showing here is the integrated uh, fluorescence uh, from 2014 to 2018 within rivers inlets. And this is at all of the stations we collect data. And this gray is when we saw this oxygen minimum or oxygen minimum layer form. And you can see that it forms after the spring bloom in every case. And the length of the season that we see this oxygen minimum layer is generally tied to the strength of the, of the spring bloom as well. And so in that case, it suggests that it's remineralization that is utilizing the oxygen within the inlet. And we've quantified that. So we calculated an apparent oxygen utilization and we assumed a red field ratio. And based on that, we uh, estimated a minimum remineraliza remineralization rate of 0.24 grams of carbon per meter squared per day which is feasible given previous estimates of remineralization in this inlet. And so um, again, this implies that most of the, the um, material that is remineralized is coming from phytoplankton as well. And so just to summarize these processes, uh, this is again, what we think is happening. So in the winter time, uh, there's lots of storms, there's really strong downwelling. This sets up this uh, current that flows along the coast and as it crosses the mouth of Rivers Inlet, it forms advection and that um, advection brings this reoxygenated shelf water into Rivers Inlet. As soon as those winds stop, we, well, around the time the winds stop, we get a spring bloom uh, and, and as those cells sink, they cause um, remineralization and that results in a loss of oxygen. And then the base of this oxygen minimum layer is, is sort of capped by upwelled water, which has higher oxygen that's brought into the inlet. And that is it. <laughs>